again. What I'd like to start with is a little bit of a review, because we've been covering a lot of history. Remember two lectures ago, we had the complete collapse of Egypt. There was anarchy, there was no real pharaoh, we hardly have any records. Well, the next dynasty, right, the, the 11th dynasty, what we talked about last time, they got it all together again. It wasn't easy. They had first those intefs who were kind of just claiming they were kings, but they weren't really kings. And then finally, the Mantuhoteps pulled it together. Well, in this lecture, I want to show you that Egypt continues on a roll. They really do. We're going to have Dynasty 12 here. And what we've got are kings who are sort of have an establishment mentality. You're going to see these are guys who don't have to prove anything. They've pulled the country together. You're going to see that they control all of Egypt. They build pyramids. They foster great religion, religious texts. And also, you're going to see that they're very skilled at controlling the press. Now, there weren't newspapers then, but they control literature in an interesting way for political purposes. So that's what I'm going to try to do. But let me start with a little bit of art history. Now, remember in the first lecture, I talked about how there are different approaches to history of Egypt. There were the philologists, you know, who look at language and try to figure things out. And then there were the art historians who look at statues and paintings and try to figure something out about the history. Well, this is a good point. To, to talk about that. Remember the Mantuhoteps. They are the first kings who really pull it together. Mantuhotep I is the one who really unites Egypt. Well, there are statues of Mantuhotep, and what they show is a kind of football player type guy. It's brute force. He has a thick neck. His hands look like hams, right? And what he's really saying, in a sense, is, I'm powerful, right? That's one thing that the art tells us. But another thing that it tells us is that they didn't know how to do it well yet. Now remember, the previous period was total anarchy. You didn't have royal studios of sculptors anymore. They weren't supporting artists like they used to. So by the time Mantuhotep becomes king, he's got the wherewithal to do whatever he wants. Remember, he builds a big temple? But his statue, it's a clunker. They didn't have the sculptors. They hadn't learned how to do it yet. Well, if you look at the art of the next dynasty, the one I'm going to talk about today, Dynasty 12, it's refined. By now, they've developed royal studios. They've got artists who've been working for a while, and these guys are getting really skilled. So very often, the art historical approach will tell us something that anything else won't. Now, let's start with this dynasty. The first king, his name is Amenemet I. And his name is important. He's a commoner. He is not royalty. Dynasty 11 ended, and we have a new dynasty, and I think, I'm not sure, I think that he was the vizier, the equivalent of the prime minister of the previous pharaoh. Right? So he's probably an important guy, but he has no royal blood in his veins. But he does something very interesting. Right? He has a papyrus written. Right? And it's supposed to be fiction, right? sort of, sort of. Uh, it takes place way back in the good old days. The papyrus is in Leningrad in Russia. And what he says is he sort of tells the people that he was prophesied to be king. He was going to be king. Let me tell you what it says. It's, it's really neat. Um, it's an example of how you can sort of create your own literature. And it's sort of, it's like a newspaper that he's printing for himself. Here's what the papyrus says. He says, now remember, there was an intermediate period. Life was terrible before. The prophet is saying, in the future, there's going to be terrible times. But then something's going to happen. He says, then a king will come from the south. Ameni will be his name. Now, Ameni is like the nickname for Amenemet. Right? So we know he's talking about himself. This is who's going to come. Ameni's going to come. He says, he will take the white crown. He will take the red crown. Right? Now, he's going to wear both crowns. He's going to unify Egypt. So Amenemet is writing this papyrus, or having it written for him, to tell people, I'm a legitimate pharaoh. It was prophesized, right? And he says, he says, he will join the two mighty lands, right? He says, he will rejoice, O people of his time. The son of man will make his name for all eternity. Now, when he says the son of man, what he's really doing is he's acknowledging that he's a commoner. Remember, the pharaohs were called sa Ray, son of Ray, son of the sun, right? So he's saying, look. There's this papyrus that predicts that somebody's going to come. 
become king of Egypt, wear the red crown and the white crown, and Ameni is going to be his name, and people are going to rejoice in his time. So he's, in a sense, created his own legend. But he's saying, I'm a legitimate king, right, because I'm prophesized. Now, as you know, kings had more than one name. He's got another name, his Horus name, and that name, he calls himself repetition of births. Now, repetition of births, what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, it's almost literally renaissance, a rebirth. What Ameni is saying is that under me, there's going to be a rebirth of Egypt's greatness. They're going to make Egypt great again. So his name is important. Now, he founds a new capital. Remember, he comes from the south, probably around Thebes, which is in the south, right, in upper Egypt. But he moves the capital. The capital is moved to an area in the Fayum. Now, the Fayum is in the north. Right? It's about 30 miles out of Cairo, southwest of Cairo. It's, it's, it's in the north. And it's, it's a kind of lush area, rather green. There's, there's, there's a depression where there's a lake. It, it's, it's kind of pleasant. And he calls the new capital city Itali, binder of the two lands. So in other words, he's going back in this old theme of, hey, we're unifying Egypt again. We're going to be together. Now, he has money. This is now not the, the 11th dynasty when they're just fighting their way to get back to greatness. He's got money, and he does big things. One way you can tell if a dynasty is doing well is look at the tombs. Are they big? Are they lavish? And if you look at the tombs of his officials, people who ruled during his era, you can see they're big. Now, for example, there are tombs at a place called Beni Hassan. Beni Hassan is just Arabic, right? It means the sons of Hassan. Um, it's a place in the middle of Egypt. And we call it actually Middle Egypt, right? Between upper and lower, you know, you don't know what to call it. It's Middle Egypt. And this is where there are big tombs of guys called the nomarchs. Now, Egypt was divided into 42 gnomes. But they're equivalent of our states, just like states in the United States, Texas, New York, right? Gnomes. And the rulers of each state, who would be our governors, were called nomarchs, right? Rulers of gnomes. Their job was basically collect the taxes for each gnome, each guy collected the taxes, and send the pharaoh his share in the capital, which was now in the Fayum. We have the tombs of the nomarchs of this dynasty at Beni Hassan, right? Middle Egypt, and they're spectacular. They're large, cut into rock cut caves, right? They're like caves cut into rock cut of a mountain. Beautifully painted. Rather unusual, by the way. It shows scenes of daily life, which is normal. It shows people wrestling. It shows the army working out, doing maneuvers, kind of, you know. And it almost is like, remember when you were a kid, there were these little booklets you could flip and the people would move, the little cartoon figures would move when you flipped them? It's like that. You have a long sequence of figures, guys wrestling, first one hold, then another hold, then another hold, and it kind of gives you a sense of motion. It's rather nice. And in the tomb of one of these nomarchs, Hanum Hotep is his name. Now, Hanum Hotep. Hanum was a ram-headed god, right? This was an important god, and his name means Hanum is pleased, right? And this was the antelope gnome, right? So there's, there's the right, right area. Hanum Hotep says on his walls that during his reign, they did an entirely new survey of the land. Now, a survey is important. Remember that the, the Nile overflows each year covering the land on both sides. What that means is you're erasing boundary markers. You know, like a farmer may have had a stone here, a stone there, where his land ends and another guy begins. Well, once you get the inundation, you've got to resurvey, right? And when Hanum Hotep can say, we resurveyed the land, it shows that there's stability again. It shows that they're back to the good old days of people have land, everybody knows where his place is. That's important. You know, the inundation also, really got the Egyptians into mathematics because they had to do some geometry to do resurveying. It's kind of a practical thing, though. They never did mathematics for the abstract sense of just doing math. It was always a practical application. But this survey was important. And during the reign of Amenemet I, they did the survey. So it's an establishment mentality. These guys are saying, we've arrived, nothing much to prove. And Amenemet I builds himself a pyramid. Again. They're hearkening back to the good old days of the old kingdom. Remember Sneferu, the pyramid builder, 
almost every time I, I see something that looks good that the Egyptians are trying to do, I think of Sneferu. I think they're looking back to him and saying, he's our model. We're, we're back to those good old days. So he builds a pyramid. It's a modest affair, but it's a pyramid. But what's important, the entrance is on the north side. Now, why is the entrance on the north side? Usually the entrance to pyramids are about maybe a third of the way up, roughly, a little less perhaps. And then you get a passageway going down and then there's inner passageways. But the pyramid entrance is always, almost always, up until, this, up, up until this point, it's almost always at the same place. Why? Because it points to the North Star. Now the North Star is a star that doesn't seem to move. Right? Other stars are circumpolar going around it, but it sort of seems fixed. And the idea was that the Pharaoh is associating himself with the fixed, eternal North Star. The Pharaoh is going to be forever, immutable. Right? Now, Amenemet the first pyramid has the entrance at the right place, right? North place. That shows its tradition again. We're established. Right? So he has this modest pyramid, but on the north, where it should be. You'll see this a little important later. Now, Amenemet institutes something that's never been done before in Egypt, I believe. What we call co-regency. In the last 10 years of his, of his reign, he says, I'm going to take my son, whose name is Sesostris. We'll get to that. I'm going to take my kid, and I'm going to make him king with me. He's going to be co-regent. We are going to have two kings at the same time. Now, why do that? You know, it's a new thing. Why do it? I think the answer is that Amenemet is thinking back to the intermediate period, unstable times, and he wants to make sure that his son is going to rule if something happens to him. So he says, all right, my kid is ruling with me. So if anything happens to Amenemet, the successor is established. Now remember, Amenemet was a commoner, right? He was just named Ameni, the son of a, a man, a commoner. But he wants to make sure that his son will succeed him as Pharaoh. So we have a co-regency. This is something that this dynasty is going to keep up. And you'll see, future dynasties will use it very efficiently. So, he's a co-regent. Now, it looks like it's a good thing that he did it. There is evidence that Amenemet I was murdered. Right? Now, when I say evidence, you know, we're not 100% we're not sure, but there's a papyrus. It's a wonderful tale, by the way. It's, it's, it's a fiction. It, it reads like a fiction, and I'm pretty sure it is basically fiction. It's called The Tale of Sinui. And there's a terrific... I think it's a 1950s movie based on it called The Egyptian. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a great film. But anyway, um, it says the following. Sinui is a palace official. And he's out of the country with the pharaoh's son, the co-regent. And word reaches them that the pharaoh, Amenemet I, has been killed. Now the son rushes back to Egypt. But Sinui is afraid. He's afraid of anarchy. He's afraid that there'll be chaos in Egypt. He doesn't know what's going to happen. Again, he knows what happened during the intermediate period. He doesn't want that again. So he doesn't go back. And for much of his life, he stays outside the borders of Egypt, afraid to return to his homeland. Now, there's a kind of happy ending. Eventually, the, the, the new king, Sassassar, you know, says, why is our Sinui staying away? What, what's, why doesn't he come home? There's no bad feelings. There's nothing. Why doesn't he come home? And they send a messenger. Now, he's an old man by now, Sinui. But they bring him back, and he returns to the palace, and he's taken care of. So it has a, a happy ending. But the papyrus suggests that Amenemet was murdered. Now, I think he was. I'll tell you why. And remember I said that this is a dynasty that learns how to manipulate the press. They use literature for their own purposes. Well, there's another document, which is supposedly the advice of Amenemet I, written by Amenemet I, for his son. Sort of wisdom literature. This is how you run a country, kid. Right? Now, I think it was written by the son, not by the father. I think Sesostris really wrote it after the, after the father was dead, and you'll see why. Let me read you a little section, and it's, I'll tell you something about this one. It's pretty cynical. I mean, you know... Remember, the son's father has been killed, and it's giving advice about how to, how, to lead, you know, how to lead a country. And what he says is the following. 
Now, this is supposedly a Menemet talking to his son. He says, beware of the subjects who are nobodies, right? Beware of those who are plotting that you're not aware of. Don't trust your brother. Don't have any friends, right? That's pretty cynical. He says, I gave to the beggars. I helped the poor. And look what happened to me. He says, I gave myrrh to people. Now, myrrh was a really precious spice, he says, and they didn't help me. Myrrh, by the way, a little sidebar. Myrrh was what was used by the ancient Egyptians as chewing gum, also as breath mints. They would take myrrh and mix it with wax, and you could kind of chew it, and that was your chewing gum. Uh, but anyway, that's a sidebar. Back to Amenemet's advice. He says, but he who ate my food raised opposition. Right? He whom I trusted plotted against me. And then he almost describes how he was killed. Right? Now, obviously, this is not quite a man at doing it, but he says, it was after supper, during the night. Weapons for my protection were turned against me. So it was an internal plot. Possibly his very own guards did this to him. And he says, you know, I had assigned order to everything. Life was good, and look what happened. Right? So it's, I think, he really was killed. It's, 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 it's a, a rare thing. Now, there's a kind of funny political problem here. The king is divine, a god. You can't really come out and say, my father was murdered. It's kind of the thing you just don't talk about. It's kind of like when the Queen of England gets indigestion. You don't, you don't talk about it. And so they, he couldn't come out and say in this document that my father was murdered. So they talk about the plot, they talk about weapons being turned, but they never say he was actually killed. And at the end it says, he's talking to his son supposedly, I give you the contents of my heart. It says, wear the white crown of a god's son, the seal that's in it, is in its place assigned by me. The seal is in its place assigned by me. What he means is, you're the legitimate heir. I made you co-regent. You're in, kid. So, but it's a cynical document. Really cynical. But Amenemet I, I think, was really murdered. But anyway, his son takes over. Sesostris I, right? Who's also called Senwasrit. There are many ways of transliterating the name. Same, same guy, Senwasrit, Sesostris. Sesostris is the Greek ending. He's another great king. I mean, he was a, a chip off the old block. He was like his father. Maybe the ten years of co-regency really helped hone his skills. You know, he was king with his father for a while. That, by the way, must have been an interesting situation in Egypt. Two kings at the same time, because remember, the pharaoh was really the god Horus on earth. Did you have two Horuses on earth? I don't know what they thought about that. But Sesostris builds forts in Nubia. Now let me say something about Nubia. Remember that Nubia is the equivalent of the Sudan, right? They, they didn't have firm borders. Egypt's border ended in the south at a place that is today called Aswan. It's a natural border. There are big boulders in the water, in the Nile, a cataract it's called. And that's where Egyptian soil sort of ended and Nubia began. Now remember, Nubia is not what the ancient Egyptians called it. That's a later word. They called it Cush. That's biblical Cush, right? The Cush of the Bible. So he builds forts in Nubia because he wants to control the gold and the trade. Now he builds forts fairly far south. At a place that today is called Wadi Halfa, there's another big cataract in that area, and about 50 miles south, he builds two forts, one on either side of the Nile. Now, these forts are impressive, let me tell you. They are big. The walls are 30 feet high. They're about 15 feet thick. They're made of mud brick. But, you know, if you were trying to get into that fort, it would not be easy. What, uh, what Sesostris did was they put wooden beams, cedar of Lebanon, into the brick walls inside, some going horizontal, some going at right angles. So if you started to dig in, you'd hit a beam pretty fast, and you wouldn't know which way all the beams ran because they run different ways. So this is a really fortified place. Not only are the walls impressive, but the way the thing is laid out. If you were coming from Nubia by the land route, right, you got cataracts, the road goes right through the middle of the fort. <laughs> you can't go around it. You can't go in the water. You've got to go marching through an Egyptian fort that's well manned. Now, what happens at this fort 
is Egypt takes its taxes. If you're a Nubian, say, coming to do some trade, and you've got leopard skins, you've got ivory, whatever it is, they are going to take their percentage right then and there before they allow you to continue. So this was both a nice military move and a terrific economic move. They really did well with these forts. So this is Sesostris I. Right? Now he built his own pyramid, right? Another neat pyramid. Um, so these people are really doing okay. He also erects two obelisks at Heliopolis. Now Heliopolis is Greek for sun city. It's a place of sun worship. And this in the Bible is called On, biblical On. One of the obelisks is still standing. You can see it today in Egypt if you go there. And, and you should all go there. Um, he also builds a rather nice chapel at Karnak. And it's made out of alabaster. I mean, this is one of the really good works of art. It's beautiful, very refined. The hieroglyphs are just elegant. And you know what this shows? They're controlling the whole country. Because first of all, the obelisk, right, the obelisk, Granite comes from Aswan. The only place that this granite comes from is Aswan. So they're controlling Aswan. The alabaster comes further north. The alabaster quarries aren't in Aswan. That's further north. And if you look at the monuments of these people, there's all kinds of stones they're using. That means they're really controlling all of Egypt. Right? They're doing just fine. Now, remember, it's during his era, Sesostris I, that he writes this document called Advice of Amenemet I to his son. He's using the He's using the press just like his father did. And he does one other thing that his father did. He takes his kid as co-regent. Again, establishing the order. Look, he saw his father was killed. And probably the only reason he became pharaoh was it was established that he was the co-regent. So he takes his son as co-regent. And the next pharaoh we get is Amenemet II, named after dad. Right? We're going to get an alternation of kings. It's going to be Amenemet I. Sesostris I, Amenemet II, Sesostris II, they're going to alternate for a while. Amenemet II is another terrific pharaoh, terrific. He sends an expedition to Punt. Now Punt, and I'm going to talk later in some detail about Punt. Punt, we think, is modern Eritrea, which is next to Ethiopia. Some people think it's Somalia, but it, I think it's Eritrea, but it's a big deal to send an expedition. You've got to go on the Red Sea to get there. And remember, the Egyptians weren't great sailors, so they didn't love this. What they did was, when they went down on the Red Sea, they hugged the coast. Every night they would anchor. You know, they weren't great navigators. But he sends an expedition to Punt. He controls all of, you know, all of Egypt also. And his big thing is foreign trade. Again, like Sneferu, remember? Sending out turquoise miners, that kind of thing. Does the same thing. If you look throughout the Middle East, you will see objects with Amenemet II's name on it. In Lebanon, excavations have found jars with his name on it. And in his temples, excavations in Egypt have found things labeled from all over the Levant. That means they were trading with these people. It was an international time. These people were confident. They weren't worried about their borders. They're going everywhere. He builds a pyramid, right? So we got another pyramid. And then we're going to have another co-regency, right? They're keeping it up. Have that co-regency and you'll have an established successor. Then we get Sesostris II, continues that family tradition of alternating names, right? And he increases the agriculture of Egypt. Now remember, the capital is in the Fayum, which is a nice, moist area, right? It's not, it's not desert by any means. And he reclaims land, expands irrigation ditches. So this is a family that is not only, you know, comfortable, they are aggressive. They are increasing the economy. They're pumping things into the economy. He has a pyramid also. And around his pyramid were burials for his princesses and some queens. And in one of these burials, the treasures of a, of a princess named Sid Hathor Yunet is her name, were found rather beautiful. Really interesting excavation, too. Very hard. The tomb was discovered, robbed. It had been robbed in ancient times. But there was one section. And it, it seemed as if there were heavy rains at some point or something overflowed and mud flowed into the tomb. And one of the walls was kind of bricked up with mud. I mean, like 1,000-year-old mud, 2,000-year-old mud. And the excavators, at, at the beginning of this century, removed the mud very carefully. And they found the gold jewelry of Princess Siddhartha Unit. Beautiful gold jewelry. Very fine. This is another place where the art historians can help you. You can look at a piece of jewelry and tell when it was made. Middle Kingdom jewelry 
is very fine, delicate, elegant, as compared with the kind of thing you're familiar with. Is, you know Tutankhamun's jewels, those big gold bracelets and things, the rings? They're clunky. I mean, they're big, they're spectacular, they're heavy, but they're clunkers. Middle Kingdom jewelry is very fine. And along with this jewelry, they also found a, a jar, a magical jar, right? And, the, and it had an inscription on it that, that's just lovely. It's to give Sid Hathor unit cold water for eternity. It was water that would be cool forever, so she could always have a drink and invigorate her. Really kind of nice. But Sasashta II is another great, great king. Then we get a little bit of a change. Sesostris III. He doesn't alternate names, right? It was Amenemet I, Sesostris I, Amenemet II, Sesostris II. Now we get Sesostris III. We get a couple of minor changes, but let me tell you about one change that I think is kind of neat that everybody will be able to see when you go to museums. The statues change. The art changes a little. Sesostris III, his statues, if you look from the neck down, it looks like an Egyptian statue, ordinary Egyptian statue, well-muscled, you know, idealized. But the face is tired. The corners of the mouth go down. The eyes droop. It's almost like he's saying, you know, I've seen it all. These are people who are, in a sense, saying, we're the shepherds of our country. We've done a lot, but we've suffered a lot. Amenemet I is, is murdered. Um, so it's interesting. The statues of the end of this dynasty all have this tired look. Quite interesting. He's a military leader, this guy. He's not afraid. He's six foot six, by the way. Big pharaoh. The average Egyptian, by the way, was something like 5'4 for a man, maybe 5'2 for a woman. Or roughly, maybe 5'5 five five is average. Uh, they were shorter than we are, right? But um, he was 6'6. Six six. Must have been pretty impressive in his time. He built temples everywhere. They're gone now, but they were there. We can see remains of them. And he has a pyramid, built a pyramid. And you know where he puts his pyramid? At Dashur. Why Dashur? If you'll remember, Sneferu built his last two pyramids there. They're going back to the good old days. He's saying, I'm like Sneferu. Now we have his successor, who's Amenemet III. Another long reign. Portraits are just like his father's. You can't tell the difference. If you look at the head of an, you know, an Amenemet III, or something, it looks just the same. These tired faces. It's, it's, it's amazing. He has two pyramids. Now, why two pyramids? Well, remember, Sneferu had a couple. Zasser had the southern burial. King of Upper and Lower Egypt. And he's saying, I can do it. One is it. Dashur, back to Sneferu, right? And another is at a place in the fight, Hawara. Hawara. It's an interesting one. I'll tell you why. The entrance is not on the north. It's on the south. I think there's a sense, you know, while these pharaohs are showing we're tired, we've had it, there's a sense of cynicism creeping in. You know, they've seen tomb robbing, and he puts his entrance on the south so that tomb robbers won't be able to easily find it. It's an attempt at protecting what we've got. And let me tell you, it almost worked. I mean, it was robbed in antiquity, but one of the people it fooled was the excavator, Sir Flinders Petrie. Petrie came to the pyramid, saw it. It's a mud brick pyramid. Came to it, looked at it, and he said, ah, entrance on the north, no problem, because every other pyramid had had its entrance on the north. He started excavating, and for nearly a decade, he was pulling away parts of this pyramid, looking for the entrance. Finally, he never found it on the south. What he did was, he went up to the top of the pyramid, started excavating straight down, till he hit the burial chamber. And even then it wasn't easy. There were dead end passageways intended to throw off the robbers, but it had been robbed. Probably the robbers were the guys, the construction workers who worked on it, you know? But there are some interesting things. His sarcophagus was there, you know? There was another sarcophagus too. It, the burial chamber is kind of unusual, by the way. It's, it's carved out of a big single block, block or quartzite. It's pretty big, it's about 22 feet by eight, something like that, it's big. And there are two sarcophagi inside, one for him, and one for his daughter, the princess Neferu Ptah. Um, she probably died during his reign, and they put her there temporarily till she could have her own pyramid. But uh, it's quite an impressive thing. Uh, Neferu Ray's pyramid, by the way, was discovered. Was discovered. Uh, interesting excavation, by the way. It had no entrance. <laughs> what happened was, now she was dead, and then they started building the pyramid, so they cut a big pit in the ground, covered it over with limestone, and then built the pyramid on top of it. Right? And it was, it's actually one of the few pyramids ever found, discovered, where there was intact, where there was a burial. But water had gotten up, and most of it had been destroyed. I mean, the body of Neferu Ray was completely gone, dissolved in the water. There was about four feet of water in the tomb, and all you had was the beads from her jewelry was left. That's about all. When they finally pumped out the water in her sarcophagus, 
everything had settled to the bottom, about three inches worth. That's all. That was all they had of Neferupatah. But she had a pyramid. She was a king's daughter. Now, the end of the dynasty, we're not sure about much. Amenemet IV is probably the last real king. Don't have much about him. We don't know where his pyramid is, if he had one. There's one temple for him in the Fayum we found, but it's terribly ruined. And the dynasty ends with a queen as king, or ruling at least, Sobek Neferu. And that's a sign that there's trouble. Whenever you have a queen ruling, there's a problem. It's not a legitimate king. But all we know about her is she ruled for a few years, and then the dynasty ends. Now, after this dynasty, there's going to be another complete collapse of Egypt. But we know why this time there was a collapse. And we'll talk about that next time. See you then.